Good, good morning. Um, it's always nerve-wracking giving a talk in front of such a big audience, and I'm at least relieved that some of you are still here, because giving the last talk is often uh, quite a challenge. So I've recently moved to the Van Andel Research Institute in Grand Rapids, and what I want to do today is to talk to you about a very exciting emerging field uh, in cancer research, that is uh, cancer epigenetics. So what I want to do is to um, show you how important the epigenome is, um, to show you that the epigenome gets disordered in cancer, and then most importantly at the end, elaborate on the excitement uh, in the field of epigenetic therapy. So epigenetics, of course, is all about chromatin. And so what is chromatin? Well, it was first discovered in 1879 when German uh, physiologists and histologists started staining uh, tissue slides. And they noticed that the nucleus of the cell stained rather differently. And so they called it chromatin from the Greek word chromos, which means color or chroma. And very soon afterwards, it was realized that if, in fact, you looked at a cancer nucleus, the chromatin was severely deranged. And so I think it remains true, in spite of all of what we've heard at this meeting, uh, that certainly the gold standard for cancer diagnosis um, it really requires somebody looking down a microscope and looking at the chromatin and saying, this is a cancer cell. And so what we'd like to do today is to explain to you what I'd like to do is what chromatin is at a molecular level and why should it be disorganized like it is uh, in a cancer cell? So we know we have a lot of DNA in our cells, meters of it, and it has to be wrapped around these beautiful structures called nucleosomes uh, in order to pick it, uh, fit it into the mitotic um, chromosome. And the important thing is, is that there are a series of covalent chemical marks which are applied both to the DNA and to the histones, which are in the nucleosomes, which have informational uh, capability and uh, instruct chromatin remodelers, as you can see that little donut there, where to go and open and close pieces of chromatin to allow the RNA polymerase to actually access the DNA and start doing the job of making um, genes. And so if the uh, DNA is wrapped around the nucleosome, the polymerase can't get to it, and somehow it has to be opened up. And so it's all about accessibility. Where are the accessible parts in the epigenome which allow uh, transcription to occur? Now, up until now, uh, all, almost all of the focus in this field with respect to gene expression has really resolved, as you see in the bottom part of the slide there, around the transcription start site, i.e. where the transcription begins. But there's more to transcription than this. For example, there are enhancers that you can see at the top of the slide, which function as dimmers, if you like, to actually up and down regulate genes, allowing the level of expression to be controlled. The transcription start site is actually quite uninteresting from the point of view of control. It's either on or off in general. And then there are insulator regions where the DNA and the chromatin is bound to the nuclear me uh, membrane, for example, matrix, and something which has been completely overlooked, the methylation which occurs in the bodies of genes. Now, what has happened as a result of the Cancer Genome Atlas project is, is that as we've begun to sequence human cancers, which have never been in culture, all of a sudden what has popped out, which was completely unexpected, was a whole series of mutations in genes which control the epigenome. And I've just been some of these in this uh, slide here. I don't have time to go through it. So this is about the a singular achievement of the Cancer Genome Atlas Project, that it's not just RAS and P53 and RB, but actually genes which modify chromatin, which allow the chromatin to be sensed by poly uh, polymerase and so on, really are frequent, and we're talking about 30% to 50% of cancers having mutations in these epigenetic modifiers. So that's what we're interested in at the moment. Why are these mutations there, and what do they do? Could it be that these mutations are responsible for the changes that you can see under a microscope? Quite possibly so, but we don't know just yet. Now, I'm going to focus my talk entirely, well, not entirely, but mostly on DNA methylation, because I don't have time to go into the other modifications. Just to remind you 
that <coughs> we have a 5-methylcytosine in our DNA, that the predominant site that's methylated is a cytosine upstream of a guanine, and these methyl groups depicted as red balls actually have a lot of information coding content. Where they are is important, and this has been actually overlooked up until now. So what's important from the point of view of epigenetics is that DNA methylation, which is applied to our DNA during the course of embryonic development, is established in patterns which have information within them. And once these patterns have been established, they can be copied. For example, during development, there are two de novo enzymes called DNMT3A, DNA methyltransferase 3A, and 3B, which might put methyl groups, as these black balls are indicated here. And that during replication, you generate unmethylated DNA. However, there is a maintenance enzyme called DNMT1, which sees that there's a methyl group needed here and applies it, but skips this one. So this is key. You want a somatic cell to be able to divide and remember what it was before it divided. It's essential for normal development. Now, um, <coughs> I see you have a Dale Chihuly um, glass sculpture here at the Mayo Clinic, and there is one at the Van Andel Institute, and I was just thrilled when I went there for the first time because I saw that Dale Chihuly had actually obviously knew about epigenetics because this DNA molecule that he made out of glass actually has these red balls on them. And so that's what convinced me to take the job. So um, yeah, just to remind you that uh, our DNA, the, the CPG sites, the ones which accept metal groups, are not um, randomly distributed in our DNA. They're actually overrepresented, uh, underrepresented, and most of the methylation, the red balls, occurs in the regions which are, in which the CPG site is not seen as frequently as it should. And then there are these regions called CPG islands that you may well have heard of, which actually, although a minority of DNA, actually make up more than 50% of all the promoters of all the genes in your body. So these little CPG islands are quite uh, important, and they are actually, uh, can be controlled by two fundamental systems to repress them. A, a system called polycomb, which is a lysine 27 methylation on one of the histones. I'm not going to be talking about that. And they can also be silenced when they're on the X chromosome by a DNA methylation, which we've just been talking about. Now, what go this is an absolutely normal situation in development where genes on the X chromosomes have to be silenced in order for one chromosome to be active in every female somatic cell. And something goes wrong in the formation of a cancer, which is the most studied uh, area uh, so far, in which genes, uh, promoters, which should not be methylated, become methylated. And this can result in silencing of a gene, thus resulting to abnormal patterns of expression, because the promoter gets switched off, it gets locked off, it cannot be used. So as I said, all of the interest is really focused, as indicated on in the arrow here, and this kind of silencing, but I want to digress very, very briefly and talk about the enhancers. Now, people are fascinated by how the environment influences the epigenome. You know, you're born with your genes, right? You get them and you've got them and you can't do, you know, you might have a few mutations and so on. But your epigenome is constantly contacting the environment. And so we've always wondered, how does the environment influence the epigenome? Uh, very difficult to know. You don't know how long somebody smoked, you don't know when they started smoking, and so on. So we took advantage of an experiment, which is not really an experiment, but it's a therapy which is used to treat bladder cancer, to try and see how stable is the human epigenome. And we took advantage of the fact that the urologists do uh, a surgery in which they construct an artificial bladder, as indicated here, from a piece of, um, of uh, 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 an ileum, uh, a piece of, it, of small intestine, and plumb it up so that a patient doesn't have a bladder but has an artificial bladder here. And so what you've done is, is you've taken a piece of colonic uh, tissue and you've put it in a urine in, environment which is urine. Completely different microbiome, completely different environment. So you know exactly when the surgeon did the operation, and you know exactly that you know when the change in environment occurred, and so what does that do to the epigenome? Well, what you can do is every time the patient comes back to the clinic, is actually take a urine specimen and measure the methylation in the urine specimen, 
using a, uh, uh, an array which we use is called the Illumina 450K, in which blue is unmethylated and yellow is methylated. You can see these particular probes here are all methylated. There are thousands of them arrayed on this array here in peripheral blood cells. They are not methylated in the small intestine, but in these neobladders, they become progressively more and more methylated. So where are these probes? What are they? What's changing? Why are they changing? And what we find is, is that, in fact, these changes are actually time-dependent, depending upon when the patient had a surgery. And so for the very first time, we can show that even under this extreme uh, physiological stress, that the, the epigenome can change 5% per year, which is actually, I think, quite, quite high. And the exciting and interesting part was is that the, if you look and see where are these changes, most of them occur in enhancers. So when you take a piece of small intestine and you take it away from its normal environment, you maintain the same blood supply, they don't do anything to the blood supply, but you put it in contact with urine, you can see that the enhancers, remember these are the dimmers, the guys that actually control the level of expression, get significantly changed. And far fewer changes occur within the transcribed region. So enhancers are changed dramatically by the environment. And so we've been looking, I think, in the wrong place up until now by focusing entirely on promoters rather than looking at the real dimmers or, uh, which actually are regulating the genes uh, at the chromatin level. And each neobladder adopts a unique uh, epigenome. This is a principal component analysis of five blood samples and some bladder samples and some small intestine in yellow. And the blue guys here are the enhancers which have gained methylation. So the epigenome has become completely disorganized uh, in these uh, particular tissues. And some of them also, the, the ones that lose methylation, display the same uh, yeah, uh, behavior. So I think this is the first direct evidence, uh, you know, which you can actually um, measure very, very precisely, which says that, yes, the epigenome and the environment talk to each other. And one of the fundamental things we've seen here is that the alterations are in the enhancers rather than the transcription start sites. I, always, I, I, I love this approach because can you imagine if you try to do this experiment and, and we try to publish this paper, uh, somebody, one of the reviewers said, well, why don't you do it in a mouse? Uh, well, I don't know if you've ever tried to do one of these, I haven't, but to try and do a bladder, uh, make an artificial bladder in a mouse would be kind of difficult to do. And so I think this is an example where one, if you're uh, careful, can use actually human tissue to conduct a real experiment uh, which you actually cannot do in a mouse at all. So if we look in cancer, we see a massive enhancer changes. Um, I'm not going to go through this kind of data because it's, it's pretty laborious. But what I wanted to say to you is that in the first case, I've shown you what happens when you put a small intestine in, in a different environment, that most of the changes occur in enhancers. I can also tell you that if you look in a cancer, that most of the changes are in the enhancers. And finally, I can tell you that nobody's really looked at this yet. And so it's going to be very important as we move forward that we understand uh, enhancers, which really are fundamental to the controls of the levels of genes, to the control of why we develop the way we do, and, and, and to really function uh, in a way which is, uh, is not understood at all at the moment. So enhancers are important. Now having said that, I'm going to revert to my old epigenetic close and start talking again about transcription start sites. So this is what we know from a variety of experiments, um, which, uh, again, I'm not going to go through in any detail. In this drawing, I'm showing you a gene, which is a CPG island, which is unmethylated. And during the course of aging and uh, infection, what we can see, I didn't show you this because I was focusing on the enhancers, but we can see a certain subset of promoters which undergo methylation changes as a function of aging or infection with various, uh, various agents. And that during the formation of a cancer, what we see is the silencing of genes, for example, the P16 tumor suppressor gene. 
which result in this gene being um, inactivated because the promoter does not function, even though the enhancers might be functioning. And so this has led to the idea that maybe what we could do is to reverse these changes. Can we take genes which have become permanently silenced in a human cancer and switch it back on again? Can we restore growth control to the cells? Many of these genes that we find that have behaved in this way, in fact, are uh, growth control genes. DNA repair genes are another example. So if we look at the extent of the methylation changes in cancer, the, po the point of this slide is they're truly uh, very, uh, there's a large number of them. And so this shows you a plot of methylation in a tumor versus the methylation in the adjacent colon. And this is using whole genome by sulfite sequencing, essentially using what's been talked about throughout this meeting, but treating the DNA firstly with sodium bisulfite, which reveals and allows you to look at where the DNA methylation is. And you can see here that there's a big drop in methylation of these probes, as indicated in red here, in the tumor relative to the normal colon. And then MP here means methylation prone. So these are regions which have become extensively methylated in the cancer, but which are completely unmethylated in the normal. So the point is that this is not a culture line artifact. This is actually very common, uh, and, and there's a large, um, if you look at the whole epigenome, uh, the whole genome, you can see lots of changes. Now, another question you might ask, well, do all cancers have DNA methylation changes? Well, fortunately, as part of the Cancer Genome Atlas project, 10,000 tumors have been examined for methylation changes on this infinium array using bisulfite sequence, which I just described to you. This is the result from the USC, where the, this analysis was done by Peter Laird and his group. And it just shows you, you can't read these, but there's probably about 25 different human cancers here. And every single one of them has a DNA methylation alteration, multiple alterations. So these changes are very common. Now you might ask yourself, well, okay, there are lots of mutations, that are what we might call passenger mutations. What about these methylation changes? Are they all passengers? Well, in fact, uh, they're not. And so we have identified in this paper we published, which again, I'm not gonna talk about, which shows us that in fact, some of these methylation changes are absolutely essential for the survival of a cancer cell. So this, these changes are common. They're in all human cancers, there are no exceptions. And some of them can act as drivers. So this is Jones's rules for cancer DNA methylation. All tumors have it. We see hypermethylation of CPG islands. We see hypomethylation of the genome. It occurs in precancerous states. I didn't really show you that. The model of the Coke pouch or the bladder, uh, the orthotopic bladder uh, is not really a cancer model. It diverges into unique patterns. The tumor cells require DNA methylation uh, to survive. And then finally, what we haven't got into here, but where the methylation is is really important. That has been mostly overlooked in this field. So what can we do about it? Can we change it? Well, to do that, we can actually treat uh, cells in culture with a drug which was developed in Czechoslovakia uh, in the 60s, which is an inhibitor of DNA methylation. This is 5-azocytidine or 5-azodeoxycytidine. And when these chemists uh, developed it, these drugs, they thought they'd be good chemotherapeutic agents. Uh, but my lab found actually um, some years ago that because they have an extra nitrogen in the five position of the cytosine ring here, they're actually powerful inhibitors of DNA methylation. They're very strong inhibitors of DNA methylation. And the way they work is pretty well understood. They get incorporated into DNA, as indicated here, and then they form a covalent complex with the DNA methyltransferase enzyme, which is coming along after the DNA has been replicated and trying to copy the pattern, and this enzyme gets stuck on the DNA, and then it gets degraded. And so these are powerful mechanism-based inhibitors of DNA methylation. I think they're completely targeted. I think the deoxyazocytidine only hits the DNA methyltransferases. So what happens is the DNA that's made after drug treatment remains unmethylated. 
So it's a sort of a hit and run drug. You can treat a cell, go away, and the cell can remember it saw the drug several generations later. Now people always ask me, is there specificity to this drug? And this slide shows you there is no specificity in demethylation. This shows you treated versus untreated controls. This is again using the 450K Illumina array, showing you that these probes, which were really methylated in the cells before treatment, have all become demethylated five days after treatment. But if you look 24 days after treatment, you can see that some probes have rebounded and become remethylated quicker than others. Some of them remain unmethylated. And after 68 days, you can see that all of these probes um, or the vast majority of them, have reassumed their methylation pattern. So the drug inhibits DNA methylation. It causes a genome-wide change in the DNA methylation pattern. And then after you remove the drug, the epigenome tries to reset itself and to remethylate those probes which were methylated before the drug was used. Now, uh, these drugs are, have, have quite a remarkable ability to reprogram cells. And we wonder if this has, might have something to do with the therapeutic activity of this compound in human beings. So we first discovered this drug quite a long time ago, as you can see in the bottom of the slide there, by exposing a, an immortal line of mouse embryo uh, cells, probably immortalized stem cells, as a matter of fact, for 24 hours to the drug, then removing the drug, and when the cells um, had reached the monolayer phase, they all of a sudden began to differentiate into muscle, fat, and cartilage. So this is quite an amazing experiment because you're taking a cell which doesn't normally express these complicated differentiated phenotypes. You expose it for 24 hours to a DNA demethylating drug, and then you remove the drug, and you get all these differentiated derivatives a certain time afterwards. Clearly, the drug is having marked effects on the differentiated state of the cells. And there's one peculiar thing about the, these uh, observations, uh, these, uh, this system, uh, and I don't have time, I don't want you to spend time trying to figure out the graph, but the most important thing is that at low doses, you don't get much biological response. At, uh, uh, but at about two micromolar, which is a sort of a medium dose, you get a strong response, and then, as you increase the dose, what happens is you get less and less response. So these drugs have this peculiarity of a bell-shaped curve. And for many, many years, when I gave this talk in front of clinicians, uh, they would all tell me that this meant that this drug would never make it into the clinic, because you can't treat people with uh, um, uh, drugs which have this kind of uh, uh, dose response. And so, essentially, when clinical trials were conducted, um, the clinical trials always go for the, at that time, for the maximum tolerated dose. And so, essentially, the maximum tolerated dose um, actually has side effects. Uh, and if you really want to treat patients with these drugs, low dose is better. So, for that reason, I believe, it took 40 years from the time that we uh, described the effects of this drug on the epigenome for the drug to become FDA approved for the treatment of myelodysplastic syndrome. So this is now the standard of care uh, for MDS. And I think that the, uh, it just sort of exemplifies the fact uh, that finding the right dose is really critical. And so mostly these days low doses are used and most patients uh, do not show uh, strong toxic responses. This is a lady who's been on the drug for five years um, she um, actually recognized my license plate of my car. Uh, I've been married to these drugs for quite a while, and so my license plate is 5 A's a C. And she came up and said to me, okay, I, I've been on this for five years, and she's still doing really well. Unfortunately, most patients uh, only would, um, uh, would start, um, <clears throat> you know, um, the, the, the tumor would come back after about a year. So do, how do these drugs work? Well, um, one of the things one would expect is, is that they work as demethylating drugs. And uh, it's been very, very hard to actually figure out exactly why these drugs work. 
But this slide, which is uh, I obtained uh, um, uh, from my colleague John Pierre Issa, who's a temple um, in, in Philadelphia, shows that if you take the tumor cells circulating in these uh, MDS patients, in AML patients, uh, you can in fact detect demethylation of the so-called line element, and that the responsive patients actually show uh, a, a, a reduce, a, a, a take longer to remethylate the gene uh, after the drug has been removed compared to those that are non-responders. But quite honestly, we still don't know um, how the drugs work in patients, and we're still trying to figure out precisely whether they act as demethylating agents uh, in patients and that the patients get better because of this reason. So, together with my colleague uh, Steve Balin, uh, we began four years ago to see whether we could actually take what had been learned uh, in the uh, leukemias uh, to begin to work on solid tumors. And uh, we were funded as an epigenetic uh, team to do this by Stand Up to Cancer. And so what we're trying to do is to actually see whether we can make this, um, uh, uh, this uh, treatment more viable in, in multiple different um, scenarios. So just to remind you, the responses with epigenetic therapy are low, uh, low doses are better. Uh, you have to remember that these drugs, the ASA molecules, uh, uh, which are FDA approved, are cell cycle specific agents. In order to inhibit DNA methylation, they actually need to be incorporated into DNA. And the other point is, is that um, there's a delayed response. And I think this is also delayed, pardon the pun, the application of these drugs in the clinic, because you, you, these are not being used as uh, cytotoxics. And so when the patient is treated with the drug, there is not necessarily an immediate response. Rather, there is a delay. And sometimes that can be difficult to deal with in a clinical scenario. So we don't really know the answers to all of these questions, but that's what we're trying to do as part of our dream team. So because the drugs are genomic drugs, I'm talking now about 5-azocytidine or Vidaza, um, or 5-azodeoxycytidine, and we focused on promoters, where as I said, we still haven't done anything on the um, enhancers. There are many ways that you think that they could elicit a good response in the patient. For example, they might turn on the P16 tumor suppressor gene. It's been shown, as I'll show you in a minute, that MLH1, the DNA repair gene, which is responsible for making a, 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 a ovarian cancer resistant to platinum therapies, uh, becomes methylated. And you turn it on, you can restore sensitivity. And then I did talk to you here about differentiation. I think one of the exciting things about these drugs is they may allow us to actually target the cancer-initiating cells, which are slow-growing, but which um, we might be able to turn on the genes which are responsible for differentiation and um, in this way um, allow patients to uh, respond. So the future belongs, we think, to um, combination therapies, uh, com combining epigenetic therapy with chemotherapy. This is a paper um, <coughs> from, from uh, Indiana showing that if you, women that become resistant to platinum in ovarian cancer, if you retreat them with the low doses of 5-azocytidine, you can restore the sensitivity of that cancer to, uh, uh, to platinum. So there are lots of trials that are looking at this at the moment. But one of the things that we're particularly excited at the moment is to actually look at the combination of epigenetic therapy with immunotherapy. And so what we've known for many years, if you look at what genes get turned on, it's not only these guys, but also we get tumor antigens, which are ex expressed, and inflammatory genes. And so the idea is, is that when we treat uh, with these um, uh, drugs, that we turn on uh, you know, the innate immune system, and if we can block tolerance using the exciting new um, antibodies, we might be able to induce uh, apoptosis within the cancer. So the idea is to treat patients with a demethylating agent together with uh, anti-PD-1 or PDL one antibody. The idea being, as I'm sure I don't have to go through this to you, that if we can break tolerance, if we increase 
the visibility of the tumor cell to the immune system by turning on innate immunity genes and interferons. That will bring the T cells there, and if we can block tolerance, we can increase the efficacy. So, and so my colleagues at Johns Hopkins have actually obtained some success with um, late-stage uh, non-small cell lung cancers by coupling azacitidine together with um, an anti-PD-1 uh, antibody. So this is very exciting, and, and, uh, um, but we've got a long way to go. We still don't know if this is going to really work uh, in the real world. So the summary of 5 a is a CDR. I focused my talk on DNA methylation. It's a genomic drug. It affects the entire genome. It affects the entire epigenome. I showed you that. It induces differentiation. It turns on tumor suppressors. Um, it can restore chemosensitivity. Um, I didn't show you evidence for this, but we have evidence for this. And um, I, I haven't discussed this other aspect here today, where it also influences the methylation of um, genes which are, um, uh, of the bodies of genes. So we think of these drugs possibly as being, as being able to reboot the epigenome. Essentially, the epigenome gets distorted in a cancer. And if you remove the methylation, it's rather like switching off a computer and then rebooting it in order to establish a more normal pattern of behavior. That's the idea. So to summarize my talk then, we know that this is a very simplistic view of how information flows from our DNA into proteins. Clearly, in our cells, we have this intermediate step of chromatin. And so what we've discussed here is, is that epigenetic therapy, which targets the change that the pathologist can see through the microscope, um, is in fact um, a very interesting area of, re of uh, drug development. And so many um, uh, uh, drug companies are actually designing drugs which target the polycomb system or the enzymes which remove methyl groups from DNA or from, from proteins. And I really think that we are at a tipping point because we suddenly realize that the epigenome actually is important. These genes that are mutated in human cancers often affect the organization of chromatin. So designing drugs which target those changes, I think, makes a lot of sense. And so I think that many, many uh, drug companies, almost every one of them, has a program developing such drugs, and you will see them in the clinic pretty soon. So I want to finish by, again, thanking you all, particularly for sticking around. Um, uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, I have a very active lab. I collaborate a lot with Johns Hopkins, with Steve Balin, and at USC with Gangning Liang, uh, with Ben Berman at the Epigenome Center. And just to disclose, in fact, that I do uh, consult for Aztec Pharmaceuticals, which is designing a new DNA methylation inhibitor, or a prodrug, and Zymo, which develops kits to look at DNA methylation. So thanks a lot. It's great to come here, and um, I look forward to any questions, should you have any. Thank you for wrapping us up, doctor. Uh, <laughs> One point of clarification, I just want to make certain. You talked about the fact that um, where the methylation occurs is important. Can you just clarify that a little bit? Yeah, so, so what we know, so, so, the, so what we know is, is that there are lots of regions of our DNA are methylated. Um, and we've always thought that the, the demethylation was involved in turning genes up or switching them on. But it turns out that the bodies of genes, in other words, most of the coding information where the coding information is that stipulates make, you know, this protein's uh, sequence is actually heavily methylated. And we sort of just ignored that. You know, it's, just a, you know, it's just there. But it turns out it's probably really important in actually paradoxically increasing the level of expression. So you have to be careful where you look. You know, it, 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 it can make a big difference. OK. Um, a fun question here. Is clinical practice ready for epigenetic testing and vice versa? Oh, yes, yes. People are very interested in using methylation markers. In fact, I think there may be a colon cancer detection kit that's being developed here at Mayo, which has three markers of DNA methylation in it. And a company which I helped found uh, 10, 12 years ago called Epigenomics 
um, is trying to um, market a, a kit which can detect methylated alleles in your blood and tell you that you uh, should have a colonoscopy. Mm. So yes, and, and also in the, in the, in the clinic, uh, treating brain tumors, I think methylation is w widely used to tell whether the brain cancer will in fact respond to a particular kind of therapy. Okay, a question from our audience that came in. Can you predict epigenomic related cancer risk of an individual from their parents? Very good question. I have to think about that. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think so. I don't think there's been any evidence for that. You mean that there might be, they, I don't think we know actually. I don't think we've looked look well enough. It's a really, really good question. Mm -hmm. But there's a big, just so I might uh, amplify that, there's a big controversy as to whether you can pass epigenetic information to your children. Uh -huh. So, you know, there's this idea that if you're um, a bad person and you smoke, <laughs> uh, that that's going to mess up your DNA methylation patterns in your germ cells and your kids are going to have a problem because of that. Hmm. That's the kind of thing we're not sure about at the moment. Very controversial. Okay. Uh, this is clearly from a knowledgeable member of the audience who writes, my impression of the epigenome has been that it's very dynamic. Each tissue has its own profile, which is modified by many factors, including you know, perhaps diet. So the questioner asks, could you clarify the extent of rigidity implied by your 5% per year measure versus variability in normal methylation profiles and how tissue specific the variability is. Yes, so the, again, this is a very important question which hasn't been looked at because we haven't really focused our attention on looking where the most variable regions are. There are studies to do that at the moment. But in general, I think that uh, tissues do have differences in DNA methylation patterns, but the, at the end of the day, they're very similar. I showed you five white blood cells on the left there I don't know whether you can remember those yellow bands, but they look pretty similar. Mm -hmm. And then all of the small intestines were the same, demethylated at those regions. And then if you looked at the, um, on the right-hand side, which were bladder tissues, again, there's quite a lot of similarity between them. I like our experiment because it allows us to ask the question directly. It's almost impossible to tell from you know, a dietary study. It's not, it doesn't change dramatically if you go and have a beer or something like that. <laughs> good, good to know. Or a glass of wine, I hope. Uh, wine's okay too. Okay, yeah. good. Whew. Just checking. Um, it, one of the great things about this conference as we're wrapping up is how we have been able to uh, really kind of tie together the research and the clinical perspectives here. And this is a question that I think gets at that. Do you think you should combine epigenetic drugs with conventional chemotherapy or standalone? Well, I think in the hematology arena, uh, MDS, the drugs are given alone. Um, uh, when we're treating patients with solid tumors, we do include what's called a histone deacetylase inhibitor. So we're hitting two parts of the epigenome. But yes, as I said the, in the ovarian cancer trial, the idea is you, you, it's called priming. You use epigenetic priming. You treat first with the demethylating drug, to turn on the genes which make the women respond, mm. the women's cancer respond to the chemo. So you're giving back the same chemo. And so many of the studies now, and, and in children, for example, looking at uh, AML, uh, physicians are combining cytotoxics with the epigenetic drugs. And so I think that leads to something I was wondering, just in terms of how durable are the responses of the patients to these various therapies. Yeah. Very good question. <laughs> Uh, the, uh, the, the problem is, is that after you remove the methylation, as I showed you in that one slide, that after a period of months, the methylation comes back again. It's rather like pushing a, um, a ball into the water and then it pops out again. So it, the, the methylation comes back. And so I think, unfortunately, that as we go forward, we're going to have to think of uh, you know, chronic therapies. Um, unfortunately, these therapies are not going to be totally durable. So most of the patients, the hematological patients on these drugs are treated every month, and some of them actually um, have been treated over many, many years. That woman that I showed you mm -hmm. uh, gets, uh, comes in every month for a, a dose of uh, mm. Vidaza. I confess I'd not heard the term chronic therapy, but certainly Well, I meant, makes, uh, yeah, maybe sense. it's not a good term. I'm, yeah. I'm not a physician, no, that's it, probably the problem. It, 
I, I got it though, yeah. so that, yeah. I must say something. Um, another question from our audience. Given the methylation changes that you described in neobladder patients, um, this person asks, I would expect a number of neobladder cancers to develop over time. Have you observed anything along those lines? Yeah, well, that's a very good question. I, I think, um, you know, the, in general, uh, tumors have not been observed in these, uh, in these neobladders. But I think you have to remember that there are very, very few patients. I mean, the number of people having these surgeries, even at a big place like Mayo, is the order of, um, you know, 10 a week or something like that, probably, I don't know. So there's not a huge number of patients, and many, in many cases, of course, the patient uh, succumbs to, a, you know, a metastasis somewhere else. Mm. So we don't really know yet. Okay. And it looks like a, a good final question from our audience. Have you considered sequence capture or targeted enrichment for your DNA methylation studies? And if so, what benefits do you see of this technique versus the 450K beat chip array? Yeah, I think, I think that the answer is yes, we've considered it. We'd like to come up with a panel that we could run, and um, that's certainly the way that, that people are going right now, absolutely. I, I think the 450K is too cumbersome. Um, to, you know, to use in, 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 in daily applications. Okay, wonderful. Please join me in thanking Dr. Peter Jones. Thank you.